This morning, I want to share with you uh, the message on Thanksgiving. <clears throat> Thanksgiving is a time to remember. We've come a long way since the first Thanksgiving in Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. The first Americans had no homes. Think about this. They had no homes, no government agencies to help them settle in, no transportation except walking. Their only food came from the sea or the forest. They had no money and no place to spend it. They had no way of communicating with home, no Medicare to provide health care for them, no Social Security to lift them up. But they did have four of the great, greatest of human values. They had initiative, they had courage, they had a willingness to work, and they had a faith in God. And I want to give you a little bit of history about, about Thanksgiving. Uh, some, there's only three countries in the world that celebrate Thanksgiving in this fashion. That is America, Canada, and the Philippines. On that first Thanksgiving day, 102 people, or not on the day, but 102 people left England for the New World. But after only one year, over half were dead because of disease and starvation. They buried them in unmarked graves so that the natives who were hostile would not know how many people were left alive. One year after their arrival, another 35 people showed up without any provisions. They assumed that they would be able to live on the crops raised by the first group. That was the plan. There was no food. The crops had failed the very first year. Now the group was up to 85 people, and the food was down to five kernels of corn a day for each person. They prayed and they worked and they survived. And America will survive when we get back to the principles that made us who we are. Honoring God Almighty and giving thanks to Him. I want you to listen to, the de to our Declaration of Independence when we declared our independence from England. This is what it proclaims. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with, with certain inalienable rights, with a firm reliance on the protection and divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thanksgiving Day is a distinctive holiday. It doesn't commemorate any battle or anyone's birthday or anniversary. It is simply a day that is set aside for a nation to express its thanks to God for His benefits and for His provision. In 1789, George Washington made this public declaration. And I'm going to read a portion of that declaration. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress, boy, wouldn't that be something today, both houses of Congress, have by their joint committees requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts that many signal favors of Almighty God. Now therefore I do recommend and assign Thursday the 26th day of November next to be devoted by the people of the United States to, ser to the service of that great and glorious being who is the benefactor, excuse me, who is the benefit author of all the good that was, that is, and that will be. And so that was the proclamation of the very first Thanksgiving. It was not easy forming a nation that we call America, but we were destined to be a nation because we were birthed out of a deep conviction and love for God. When those first pilgrims sailed here, they were not looking for anything but freedom. They wanted to be free so they could worship God. And since that time, we have opened our borders to every country in the world and said, if you want to be free, then come. And this nation is made up of immigrants. From all over the world, people come and have been a part of this nation. From everywhere. We look in this congregation. There are people from everywhere. I was born here, but my descendants came from Ireland. Many of you were born here, but your descendants came from another country. We came because we all sought one thing. We sought freedom, and we sought peace, and we wanted to be a nation that formed under God and that had an opportunity to worship God. But we humans have a tendency to forget. 
We forget the benefits that God has done to us. And God has held that against us all of the life since the time of Israel. God has held something against us called forgetfulness. Psalm 78 was written to remind Israel why so many of them and so many devastating judgments of God had come upon them throughout their history. Let's look at Psalm 78 verse 11. And forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. That's why Israel was having all of this calamity happening in their lives is because they had forgot who God was. They forgot that God was the one who brought them out of, out of Egypt. When they left Egypt and done all of those things, God told them some specific promises. He said, when you get into this new land that I'm going to give you, you would do certain things at, as an observance. In other words, you will give thanks every year at a certain time because of what I have done for you. But the Bible said Israel forgot what he had done to them. And when you read the book of Psalms, and you read all the book of 78 Psalms, you begin to see all the calamities that came upon God's people because they forgot who God was. And let me assure you today, if we forget who God is, and if we forget the benefits that He has loaded this nation down with, then God will abandon us. We think sometimes and we get so smug in what we have and all the benefits that we have and all the luxury that we have, we begin to think that God's just going to perpetually bless us. Well, that's not true. Look around. God is not blessing us so much right now. America's not so blessed by God right now. There's some disfavor on it. And it's because we have forgotten the God that we serve. We have forgotten the benefits. We have forgotten to call on His name. We have forgotten to give Him praise and thanksgiving for all the things that He has done. And God said, and they forgot His works and His wonders that He had shown them. And when you begin to read in the book of Psalms, one o, I think it's 106, and we'll turn there momentarily. And I want to share some verses with you that tells us some things. But before we get to that, let's look at Psalms 9, 17. This is what God says. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Every nation, regardless of who you are, if you forget God, you will be turned into hell. In other words, God is going to forget us if we forget Him. If you look at Psalms 106, verse 13. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. This is David, some nearly a thousand years after the fact, is beginning to tell the story of why so many devastating things had come on Israel. They had left out of the land of Egypt, but they had forgotten to tell their children who it was that got them out of Egypt. They forgot to pass on the heritage that God got them out of Egypt, that God drowned an army in a sea, that God had rained food out of heaven, and that God had led them by a pillar of fire and a pillar and a cloud by day, that God had performed all of these wonderful things they had forgotten forgotten that and if you read Psalms 106 and read the whole psalm you will see that God had something against them because they forgot continually you see where they forgot they forgot to remember God they forgot to honor God they forgot to tell of the stories of God Psalms 106 verse 21 they forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt They forgot everything that God had done in Egypt. They forgot it all. And when they forgot it all, God began to take them captive again. God began to pull down who they were again. And they suffered tremendous calamities. They went back into bondage. They went under bondage in the Babylonians. They went under bondage. And when Jesus was here on earth, they were under the Roman rule. Somebody had always been over them. And you know what ultimately happened to Israel because they forgot God? God disbanded the whole nation. And they were scattered to the winds of the earth. They went all over the world. And Israel was not a nation anymore. But in 1948, when they began to pray and to seek God, God told them to go home and I'm going to give you the land that used to belong to you. And they went home and the nation of Israel was formed again in 1948. Now, why do you suppose God did that? Because there was some repentance that went on, and God remembered the covenant that He made with them. Do you remember the covenant that you made with God? God, I will serve you if you will forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. I will serve you all the days of my life. I remember distinctly the time that I prayed that prayer, and I made that promise to God. God, if you forgive me, I will serve you the rest of my life. I was 19 years old when I made that when I made that covenant with God. 
And he forgave all of my sins, Tony Bear. He washed every sin I had away, and he forgave them. And I got up from that altar, and I went back to my seat, and I was a changed person. From that time forward, my life began to be changed. And I promised God I'll never forget that. And here I am, 58 years old today, and I remember it just like it was yesterday that I asked him, and I told him that if you'll forgive me of my sins. Now, I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to make that strong of a covenant. All I would have had to say was forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and he would have forgiven me of my sins. But I said, the, I said those other words, God, I will serve you and I will do anything you ask me to do. Three weeks after that, he called me to preach. And that started my life on a journey and I left home the next year and I've never been able to go back home again in my life. I've been gone from my home for 40 years and I've never been back home more than five or ten days at a time. And probably I can count on one hand in 40 years how many times I've been home. Probably 10 times in 40 years I've got to go home. Maybe that many times. But that's okay because I've got a home whose builder and maker is God. It's not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. And one day I'm going to walk on streets of gold and my family's going to be there. My mother's there. My dad's going to be there because he accepted Christ. And that is a covenant that I made with him. And he said if I would honor that covenant that he would honor me and begin to do great and wonderful things in my life. And let me tell you, we get that mixed up. We want the great and wonderful things to be gold and fortune. I want it to be my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren will serve God Almighty. I want them to have a legacy and it's my responsibility to transmit that news to them and to tell them of the goodness of God and to tell them how God is faithful to His covenant. It is my responsibility to transmit that faith. It is my responsibility to tell my children and to tell my grandchildren. In our house on Thanksgiving Day, we don't just get the turkey ready and everybody gobble around. Before we eat, I make all the family sit down. Everybody that's there because I'm the patriarch of that family. That's my responsibility. And I tell them why we're thankful today. I tell them the story of how America was birthed. And because of the pilgrims, we have this opportunity And the first Thanksgiving that they sat down and ate, they ate deer and corn and maybe some turkey. And they celebrated and they gave thanks to God because 102 of them left and 45 of them died the very first year. And their crops failed and they had nothing to eat and the rest of them were going to starve to death. But God caused some Indians to befriend them. And they ate that first Thanksgiving day In 1621, in November, they ate it with some friends, some Indian friends that they'd made there. They sat down and they ate that Thanksgiving together. I do not want my family to think to be to think that Thanksgiving is a time of football and just stuffing yourself till you can't move. That is not the meaning of Thanksgiving. We do that after. (laughs) You know, I'm not going to tell you that we don't do that after we have that, but that is something that's important to me. It's that we remember who God is. And I know sometimes, you know, we have visitors to our home on Thanksgiving. It may be a little uncomfortable, but listen, when you come to my house, that's the way it rolls. That's who I am. Friends and family are always welcome at my house, but you're going to hear the story of Thanksgiving. Because it's right to share why we're here. Because I want every generation to understand in my family that we celebrate Thanksgiving because Of what God has done. Not because we can afford a turkey. But if all we could afford was soup. We would be giving thanks to God. Because today we get to eat soup. We need to remember why we give thanks. And why we celebrate on that day. It was because God provided for those people. Can you imagine how thankful they were. You know how long their feast lasted. It lasted three days. They ate and celebrated for three days. They gave thanks to God for three days because of everything that God had done for them. Listen, if you did not have any agencies to provide for you, you know, they didn't have a place. Today, if we don't have a job, if we don't have work, the government's going to send us a a EBT card, and we can go down and we can buy turkey, we can buy buy whatever we want to on on that card. But those pilgrims had nothing. They depended on God Almighty. And he provided for them and they celebrated who he was for three days. 
They didn't go home. They just gathered out there and they cooked and they celebrated and they ate and they gave thanks to God. I wonder what that first Thanksgiving must have looked like. When those people gathered around and they couldn't hardly understand each other because of the language barrier. And they ate that food together. And they gave praise to God Almighty for sustaining them through that first year. And then people began to come to the shores of this nation. They began to come from Ireland and England and Russia and Ukraine and all over the world. The Philippines and Mexico from all over the world. They began to come and to form a nation. And that nation, each generation has had the responsibility to pass on to the next generation. This is why we have Thanksgiving Day. Did you know if you ask some people why we have Thanksgiving Day, they have no clue. No idea why we have Thanksgiving Day. We have Thanksgiving Day because we want, to give, we want to give praise to God Almighty. But let me tell you, church, we are forgetful people. If we do not keep it alive, we will forget why we celebrate Thanksgiving Day. I don't want to be in my 80s and be at my daughter's house and my granddaughter's home for Thanksgiving. And they're doing the cooking now. And nobody tell the story of Thanksgiving. Or even know why we're doing it. We're just here to eat turkey and go home and watch some football. I don't want that to be a part of it. We people are very forgetful. Let me share some history with you. On September the 1st, 1923, Japan was rocked with one of the worst earthquakes in history. In Yokohama alone, 100,000 people were either killed or maimed. Out of all this death came a frantic plea from the Japanese government, help. America responded by sending whole fleets of food and supplies to the stricken nation. The emperor of, of Japan cabled Washington, D.C. with this promise. This is what he promised. America, we will not forget. Yet 18 years later, the Pacific sky over Pearl Harbor was filled with Japanese warplanes that bombed Pearl Harbor and killed over 2,000 men and women. And bomb the entire island. How soon we forget. How soon we forget. The Japanese had forgotten what America had done. And we sometimes forget what God has done. The night before Jesus was crucified, he asked his followers to observe communion, which we just did. Breaking bread and his, as his body would soon be broken. And drinking the cup symbolizing the blood that was be shed. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. He asked, and we must never forget the cost of Calvary. But we do. We forget the cost of Calvary often. Thursday, our children and grandchildren and us, we will gather to celebrate Thanksgiving Day on Thursday. And one would, would, would assume because of the examples of our forefathers and because today we have so much that we would be extremely thankful. But in reality, Thanksgiving has become more about Black Friday. What's going to happen the day after Thanksgiving or at midnight on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving night? It's become about selling something for Christmas. But it ought to be about giving thanks to God. It ought to be about honoring who God is. I think the 100th Psalm was written to deal with this attitude. To remind us of our need to be thankful and to maintain an attitude of gratitude. Let's look at Psalms 100 verse 1 through 5. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. All you lands... Now, I want you to pick up in there who God is talking to in this, in this particular verse of Scripture. He is not talking to one nation. He is talking to every nation on planet Earth. All you lands serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are the people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. God said to them, when you come into the promised land and settle down in your warm home. And you have plenty to eat. Don't forget me. But they did. I led you out of the wilderness. And I brought you into a land that flowed with milk and honey. But you have forgotten me. Maybe God had us in mind when he wrote the 100th Psalm. Did you notice to whom it was written? 
The first, read, the first verse addresses all the earth, and the last verse addresses every generation. But if we don't know the book, we won't know that. The very first verse addresses every, na- every person on planet earth, and the very last verse addresses every generation. It is the responsibility of one generation to transmit it to the next generation. This message of thanksgiving is deep and wide, and it applies to every person in every era and every stage of life. We are the only country in the world, except for Canada and the Philippines, that has a Thanksgiving Day. I wonder what the world would look like if all nations had a Thanksgiving Day. Now, the Philippines, they don't have one day that they celebrate Thanksgiving. It's an event. They celebrate Thanksgiving for graduating from school, from getting a car, from getting a job. They just have a feast in the family. Those of you that know Filipinos know that they'll have a party at the drop of a hat, and most of them carry hats. I think there's something about giving thanks together with God that breaks down barriers between people. The psalmist said that all these things may change at any time, and we need to know that. They may drift away or burn up or someone may steal them. The only thing that we have for sure is our relationship with God that no one can take. And we need to be mindful of that. And that is what the 100th Psalm emphasizes. Just to scan the Psalm, verse 1, you will find the name of the Lord. Verse 2, you will find the name of the Lord. Verse 3, you will find the name of the Lord. Verse 4, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. And verse 5, you will find the name of the Lord. The basis of our thanksgiving is the name of the Lord. That is the basis of thanksgiving, to remember how we got here and who it was that helped us get here. Five things, five thanksgiving commands I want to give you today. You can write these down if you want to. Command number one, and we'll be taking it all out of that Psalms, 100. The first command, the Bible says, is to shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Everybody on earth shout to the Lord. It means to shout with the force of a trumpet, a shout of joy that comes from the very depths of our being. Maybe he solved a problem in your life. Maybe he's given you direction on where to go. Maybe he's provided a blessing and you realize it comes from God. The Bible says, so from the depths of your soul begin to shout praises to the Lord. I wonder how often it is that you shout praises to the Lord. Do you get up in the morning and you begin to say, I praise you, God, for who you are. I praise you, God, today that I have a job to go to. Most of people get up in the morning and say, I I hate to go to work today. But you ought to get out of bed saying, God, I am thankful that I've got a job to go to and a family that loves me. And I want to shout praises to you from the depths of my heart because you've given me the health to go to work. Because there's a lot of people that can't go to work because they don't have a job and they don't have health to go. But God has provided all of those benefits for us. And when we get up in the morning, we ought to shout a shout of thanksgiving. When I am old, I hope I get up in the morning and I thank God that He has given me the ability to get out of bed and that He loves me. I want to get up every morning of my life as I do today and say, God, I am so thankful that you are on your throne, that you are in control, and that you hold the world in the palm of your hand. And I can rest assured that you hold my destiny. Do you know that God holds your destiny in the palm of His hand? The very breath that you breathe, God holds in the palm of his hand. And if he stopped allowing you, you would stop moving. We get up in the morning, we ought to shout thanksgiving. This year, this time of year is a time for you and I to begin to remember how good God is. How wonderful things he's done in our life. I'm glad that we have a day that is reminded, but every day we ought to thank God for what he's done for us. It is so easy to complain about who you work for. And my philosophy is, if you don't like him, won't you just quit and find another job? Not that easy to do, is it? So you have a choice. You can be miserable in the job you got, or you can start rejoicing and thanking God that you've got a job. And I promise you, when you start rejoicing, and you stop, you know, you just start saying how you want to feel. I have a thing that I say to everybody at work. When they ask me, how am I, how you doing today, Frank? My pat answered, if I was any better... I'd be two people. 
And when the doctor told me I had cancer, exactly what I said was if I was any better, I'd be two people. And I still believe that today. I believe it with all that is within me that if I was any better, I'd be two people. God is the sustainer of my life. And he's got my life in his hand. That's why I told him I'm not doing the surgery. I'm not doing, the, I'm not doing any of it. If God ain't got it, then it ain't got I'm going to trust God that he's going to heal me and deliver me and make me whole or I'm going to go to heaven shouting, He is a good and faithful God. He will never fail me nor forsake me, but he has promised to go with me all the days of my life, even to the end of the very world. He has promised he would go and I want to give him praise and I want to thank him for what he's done in my life. He is a gracious God. He is a good God. He is a loving God. And I'm commanded to shout his praises. Even when you get bad news, folks, you're supposed to shout his praises, you know. Even when you get bad news, shout his praises. Because I still believe in divine healing. And I've been prayed for in this house. I've had people anoint me and pray over me in faith. And I believe. And you know what? When I go back to the doctor, he says, well, it's getting better. So what does that tell me? God is great. You're absolutely right. Ever who said that, you're absolutely right. God is great and he's on his throne and he's a healer. He said in his word, I'm a healer. And if I can't rejoice about what God can do, if I don't rejoice and give him praise, the Bible said the rocks will begin to cry out. And there's not a rock on this earth that's going to take my place. I'm going to stand up and begin to give him praise and to say, God, I shout praises to your name this morning because of who you are and because of what you are and because of what you've done this won't be the first time I've been healed there was another time in my life when the doctor told me you've got something that you're going to live with the rest of your life and God healed me in the bathroom at Vancouver Mall in Sears and Roebuck strange place to pick healing but I'll take it that's been almost 20 years ago and I've never dealt with anything since God is a healer, and I shout His praise. The joy of the Lord is mine, and I shout those praises every day. Command number two, serve the Lord with gladness. It didn't say serve the church. It didn't say serve the preacher. It didn't say serve the leaders or serve the organization. It said serve the Lord with gladness. I am so thankful that he's called me to preach, that he calls me to teach, that he calls me to witness. I am thankful when I'm walking through the store and God will prompt me to go back and talk to somebody or he'll prompt me to get out of my car and talk to a guy on the street. I am so thankful because I know that I'm beginning to give service to God and I do it because it's an honor and I do it with gladness in my heart. And church, that's what he wants us to do is to serve him with gladness. Sometimes we serve God out of fear, out of obligation, because our parents want us to. But I'll tell you this, when you start serving God out of gladness, when you begin to serve God because you're glad to serve Him, and it's not, you're not riding on your mama or your grandpa or your daddy's relationship with God or your heritage in the church, when you serve God, because of gladness. When you're glad to serve Him, when you're glad to do those things, when you're glad to offer yourself up, that's when serving God becomes so wonderful and so real. When you do it out of a glad heart. When you're just serving because you're glad. Oh, I tell you, you'll be amazed what those things will do for you when you will begin to shout His praises. I scared one of our workers about a year ago, uh, I was in the shop by myself, and I had on my, my Bible in my ears. I had my, my, uh, DV, not my tape going. I had the little earplugs in my ears, and I was listening to the Bible, and I was walking. You know, I was in there working, and I was uh, singing, and, and then I began to speak in tongues. And he come in, and he was standing behind me like this. He was just standing there for a little while, and I looked around, and there he stood like, man, what's wrong with you? What's wrong? Have you lost your mind? I was just in that place, just worshiping the Lord and just praying in the Spirit and enjoying myself. And there he was, standing behind me. He didn't know what to do. 
That's the goodness of God. That is the goodness of God, church. Serving with gladness. Serving with gladness. The Bible teaches that if we witness on behalf of the Lord, if we feed the hungry, if we clothe the naked, if we work for the Lord, whatever, whatever it might be, we are serving Him. If you're cleaning tables or mopping floor or cleaning this building on the weekend when it's your turn, if you're doing that, do it with gladness. You're honoring the Lord. It's an honor to clean the building for the Lord. That was my first job in the church was to clean the building and to mow the grass. I love doing that. I tell you, I mowed the grass with gusto. I would put, I actually put flags on my lawnmower and mowed that way. I had a church flag on my lawnmower. I would just mow and enjoy the Lord and just rejoice. Neighbors thought I was strange. Wait a minute, they still do. <laughs> but I, I've just come at serving God my whole life that way with just gusto and just excitement because of what He's done for me. The third command is come before Him with, with joyful songs. Psalms 98 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Man, that's all I can do. My wife tells me, honey, don't sing. But I can't stop singing. There's a, there's a song shut up in me, and I have to sing it. Even though it doesn't sound good to anybody else, it sounds good to me, and it sounds good to him. He likes receiving it. Or maybe he's got a filter it goes through before it gets there. I don't know. But he told me to make a joyful noise. And to sing joyful songs to him, and I want to do that. Have you ever noticed in these first three commands, God said, I want you to be happy? Have you ever noticed that? Joy, gladness, singing. Do you notice that in the first opening stanza there? What's the, what's the theme of that? God wants you to be happy. Shout with joy, serve with gladness, and come with joyful songs. Take a moment, look at the people around you. Do they look happy? Are you happy? God wants you to be happy. Now, you know, we've decided that what makes us happy is money. The right relationship. All of those, that's not what makes you happy. If you learn to put your trust in Him, you'll be happy. In my life, I've had the opportunity to know some beautiful, beautiful Christian people that it was an honor to be around them because they had nothing in earthly material things but they were the happiest people I'd ever seen in my life. They had joy unspeakable and full of glory. Command number four is to know that the Lord is, is God. It is He who made us and we are His and we are His people and the sheep of his pasture. What an amazing God. God is your maker. And you are created in his image. Therefore give him thanks for who you are. And stop complaining about who you're not. Why is it that we always want to be what we're not? Command number five. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For he is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. In the Old Testament, the temple, sim the temple symbolizes the presence of God. So wherever the people came to and, and entered the temple in the courtyards, they knew that God had come to meet with them there. That temple no longer exists. But the place where you and I meet today is called the sanctuary. It indicates that God is there. But we know that God is everywhere. You know that and I know that. But we should enter this house and this sanctuary with thanksgiving and shouts of praise. When we have worship service, we ought to praise God as if it was our very last service that we were ever going to praise Him. Let me ask you a question. What if, you, what if we never saw another flower bloom because we grumbled when God sent the rain? What if God stopped loving and caring for us because we failed to love and to care for others? What if God took away His message because we wouldn't listen to His messengers? What if He wouldn't bless us today because we didn't thank Him yesterday? 
What if God answered our prayers the way we answer His call to service? What if God decided to stop leading us tomorrow because we wouldn't follow Him today? Lord, help us to be thankful that you do not treat us as we deserve to be treated. I want to give you a few things to be thankful for today. If on Thursday you can't think of anything to be thankful for, I'm going to give you just a few things that you can be thankful for. Be thankful for the blood of Jesus, which has the power to save. The healing power of Christ and the cross. Be thankful for His Word that endures forever and to all generations. All of it and every promise in it. Thank God for our forefathers who gave us this nation. For the victory we have through Him over sin and death. Thank God for His unfailing love for us all. Thank Him for His goodness. Thank Him because He's always near to us. Thank Him for all the prayers that he's answered for you and I. We have a lot to be thankful for on this Thanksgiving. And I challenge you to be thankful and to give him praise and to give him honor. Because what an honor it is to serve God. And I challenge you this Thanksgiving as you sit around your table that you take a moment to remember why we're doing this. That it doesn't just become another meal, another day off of work, A lot of you will have Thursday and Friday off. Don't let it just be that's all there is. I remember growing up, we didn't have a lot. But Thanksgiving was a time that we celebrated with all of our hearts. And we celebrated for three days. For three days, our family was together and we celebrated. I'll never forget those times. We took it at my grandfather's house on my mom's side and we would all gather And we would uh, celebrate and we would remember the goodness of God. And uh, my grandmother began to pour into me faith as a young boy. And I didn't accept Christ until I was 19, but she began to pour into me the goodness of God Almighty. And I appreciate that so very much. And today, those of you that are assembled in this room with me, I challenge you on Thursday that when you gather with your family to be thankful, to be mindful to say something to your family about this. Transmit your faith. Transmit why we're doing this. Don't let it be just another day. Begin to transmit why we're having Thanksgiving Day. To give thanks to God. To give thanks to God Almighty for what He's done for us. To honor Him for His blessings. For a house to live in, for food to eat, for clothes to wear, for a job to go to. For a family that loves you, for good health. There's so much that we can thank God for. So very much. And I challenge you to do that. If you're in this room with me today and you've not accepted Christ as your personal Savior, that is the single greatest need that you have in your life. That will start your life on a journey that will transform you and change you forever. Regardless of where you are right now today, regardless of the circumstances that are around you, if you accept Jesus Christ, it will change your entire life. You'll look the same, your circumstances may be the same, but internally, you will begin a a brand new life. You'll begin a new life that will last you forever, but simply by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Is there anybody in this room with me today that you don't know Christ and you'd like to do that today? You'd like to accept Him as your personal Savior. If you would just slip your hand up. Anybody in this building today? Would you stand with me? I see your hand, young man. Yes, come here. Come here. Would you stand with me, church? And that He can accept Jesus Christ. I can. Yes, amen.